coming back here with the rookie. And we're playing Vampire of the Masquerade in New York. And we're about to meet Kaiser. Quarter easy. Surrounded by dimly lit computer, computer screens, his features are even more ghastly than you imagined. All sharp angles of twisted bone, mangled flesh, and crooked teeth. He bears them in an awful parody of a smile. The door closes behind him. Doesn't he look lovely? This is... I've seen this image before and I'll tell you later. Go ahead. So... <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, do it, do it, do it, I love it. The waste of good blood outside tells me Sophie Langley sent you, huh? You got something for me? You reluctantly pull the flash drive from your pocket and slowly pass it to Kaiser. He plugs it into the USB port on the arm of his chair and displays the data on one of the screens. That happens to be turned away from you. It takes him about a minute to access the data. Let me guess. This is from Langley. She said she'd have something like this. You her new flunky? You have to bite your tongue to keep from arguing with the word he chose, but you nod. Who do you people think I am? I saw this footage a week ago. He removes the flash drive and throws it back at you in disgust. Tell Sophie the deal's off. She wants her address. She can give me something else. Ask him again. See, I, I, I that's think... not gonna work on another vampire. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'd never use powers on another vampire, especially when you've been a vampire for less than a week. It might, but I would doubt it would work on him. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like it might not like that the one anarchist guy. Right, right. Well, especially because it depends on the power. That one's uh forcing them to do something. Yeah. Like, yeah. the one, the ones that are celerity, that's you moving very fast. Am so. I gaining power points or something while doing all this? I have no idea if there's a hidden mechanic. Alright. I'm sorry this proves disappointing for you, Mr. Kaiser. Can I do something to make it up for you? Now that I'm fully in control of my cognitive functions and no longer under the duress of drugs and or alcohol, he <laughs> seems genuinely impressed. Now that's what I want to hear. Yeah. In fact, I was just about to mention it. I have something in mind. We'll talk again soon. You do that for me, the address is yours. Now, would you be so kind as to get the fuck out of my car? You're pretty sure you're done here. You get out, close the door behind you, the car immediately starts backing up. The OPEC windows slide past you and soon the limo is on its way. Kaiser's lackey is nowhere to be seen, so you make your way to your car and drive back wondering what tomorrow brings. The bring is tomorrow. Night. Pick who you're going to talk to. Eh, Whatever. Possible. I want to finish up this stuff. You make your way through the now familiar rusty maze of the grain terminal and up the stairs to Giangelo's office. This time, however, you find the room firmly locked. <laughs> There's no pin to the door. You rip it off and scan the crooked lettering. There's been another one at the scene now. Come to Bed City? Corner of Pulaski and Gravely ASAP. Looks like the angel could use your help. Better get going. As that, pro that, that, that note looks more like something Hope would write. Or the killer. Possibly. <clears throat> you a squad... Oh, nope, you're missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you approach the address D'Angelo gave you, a squad car passes you by, sirens blaring. Following it, you make a turn from DePalk Avenue onto Pulaski Street. Sure enough, the street is awash with red light and four or so police cars parked on the nearest corner next to an ambulance confirm that you're in the right place. You move closer to what appears to be New York's finest convention, looking around in the hopes of spotting a familiar, if not altogether pleasant face. No such luck. Here to his Nosferatu lineage, D'Angelo is nowhere to be seen. You stop on the sidewalk across the street, trying to not draw attention to yourself, all of a sudden, one of the cops standing by the entrance to the building looks straight at you. He does a double take, and you instinctively look away. Bad move, you think to yourself, as you notice him making his way towards you. What you gonna do? I'm not gonna run. Yeah, that would cause him to probably shoot. I'm gonna try to start walking. Slowly but surely, you turn away and start walking in the opposite direction. The cop yells after you, trying to get your attention. You ignore him and pick up the pace. He does not let up. Suddenly, as you're passing a dark alleyway, someone grabs you by the arm and pulls you into the shadows. If the smell of cigar and cheap cologne doesn't give you away, the gravelly moisture does. 
don't move a muscle. With your back pressed against the wall, the brick wall, you remain perfectly still, waiting for the cop to walk past the alley. Good thing I was around, huh? Come on, I parked nearby. Before you know it, you're sitting in the passenger seat of a busted old sedan parked half a block away, giving you a nice view of the police gathering. Let me talk to them. I'll get us in. <laughs> we can take them. Yes, all the cops. <laughs> do your shadowy skulky thing. Hey, how about you do your shadowy skulky thing? Maybe you can find some way to let me in front of the inside. In from the inside. Shadowy skulky thingy. Jesus, kid. Childish phrasing aside, it's as good an approach as any, I guess. I'm not going to be like, I'll get us in. <laughs> and fuck it up immediately. <laughs> Without another word, he gets out of the car and heads for a nearby back alley. You watch in silence as he disappears into the shadows. A minute passes, then another. And another. You begin to worry. What if there were more cops inside? What if your moldy partner got himself in trouble? Suddenly a shadowy silhouette appears in one of the windows on the second floor. It looks like he made it after all. At least you hope it's him. The shadow waves at you and points to the corner of the building opposite the two cops. You get out of the car and quietly make your way towards the alley. Sure enough, you find that a fire escape ladder has been conveniently dropped for you. Good work, D. You mumble to yourself as you climb to the second floor, realizing you're narrating like he did. <laughs> Finding it... Oh, God. It's kind of indistinct. Yeah. Something is... Uh, Something about a gift, I think. Uh, finding the crime scene proves easy enough. You just follow the yellow police tape. Before you know it, you're standing in the middle of what used to be someone's living room. The place has been completely trashed. Knocked over furniture, shattered glass, the works. Looking around, you notice a sign scribbled on a nearby wall. It reads, His gift, our fate. Oh, yeah, that's what it says. You're no expert of typography, but... The crooked letters look sim similar to the ones you saw in the Red Hook. Sure enough, there is very little in terms of blood, save for the occasional stain that's bound to end up on the carpet once you toss someone through a glass coffee table. D'Angelo leans against the doorway. He seems lost in thought, sucking on his cigar compulsively and mumbling to himself. You lean over a bit, trying not to make it obvious that you're listening in. You manage to catch the last few lines of his monologue. The night's been kind to them so far, but the question keeps piling on. Now they found themselves amidst the wreckage of another life. It was up to them to sift through the debris and come up with a neat little pile of answers. The them is us. Oh my god! Of course it is! I, I legit thought he was like half trying to make it seem reasonable, but no, he's writing his own movie in his head. <laughs> yeah. Suddenly he tenses up as if sensing your eyes upon him. Feel free to chip in, kid. Anything catch your eye? His gift, our fate. Yeah, that's that. What do you think it means? There's that. Ha! <laughs> His gift, isn't there a theory that Kane was the first vampire? Oh, it's more than a theory. To some, it's a deeply held belief. And yeah, you're right. That it's about the gift of Cain, as in vampirism, our fate. Clearly, someone wasn't too happy to receive it. God damn it, I hate where this is going. Which is? Me being right about thin blood involvement, I mean. Anyway, looks like we're not getting any more out of this place. No way around it. We gotta see the body. In for a penny, in for a pound. Might as well be prudent. My thoughts exactly. The dustborn have it bad as it is. If I'm gonna accuse one of them of breaching the masquerade, I want solid evidence. I mean, rock fucking solid. Brother. <laughs> Lucky for us, I might know someone who could help us yeah, get us an audience with our dearly departed. 
To your surprise, he pulls out a cell phone, a busted old clamshell. <laughs> he flips it open and spends a good minute browsing through the contacts, muttering to himself. He finally makes a call. Hey, you know who this is? Yeah, that favor you owe me, time to deliver. Listen, I know you got a fresh one. The murderer in bed, steep. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I need to take a look. Yes, now. Yeah, you better. The computer got happy. It did. <laughs> With, oh, I forgot again. With that, he hangs up and gives you his trademark wry smile. I want to say that. So, are we good? Yeah, we're good. Next stop, Kings Country. County. 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 Kings County, the bleeding heart of Brooklyn. It's beating as hard as ever with ambulance after ambulance bringing in sick and wounded New Yorkers to be pumped through the tight arteries of the healthcare system. Now I'm becoming a noir narrator. <laughs> it's a dangerous place for a kindred to show their face. Incessantly crowded and full of people who specialize in noticing all sorts of physical afflictions. Especially the sort that make up the very essence of a vampire's existence. For instance, death... Thankfully, your business here tonight keeps you away from the hectic human hive of, e of the ER. Instead, you follow the Angelo to a relatively quiet part of the underground parking lot that's closest to your current point of interest, the Kings County Morgue. Having found yourself a convenient and suitably unlit spot near the hospital wall, you wait patiently for D'Angelo's contact to appear. Every now and then, you glance over at the undead gumshoe, as if to make sure his moldy mug isn't showing any sign of worry. It isn't. Or at least he's very good at hiding it. Finally, after 30 minutes or so, a lone figure emerges from the side entrance. As the human-shaped shadow walks by, you're quick to recognize him as an EMT you saw back at the murder site. Clearly nervous, the 20-something-year-old redhead can't seem to help but look back and make sure no one is following him. Finally, he stops and lights a cigar, Without even looking in your direction, he takes a puff and exclaims, seemingly to no one in particular. Room 112, you got 20 minutes. Man, we have to see what he looks like. I know. <laughs> D'Angelo speaks without looking at you. By the way, we know what he looks like. He occasionally plays D&D with us. <laughs> That's our cue. You follow the fanged detective through the same door the EMT walked out of. Luckily, this wing of the hospital seems unusually empty. Still, the confidence with which D'Angelo makes his way through the white and green corridor makes it clear he's been here before. Finally, he stops in front of one of the doors, room 112. That's your stop. The room is small with only one oversized freezer by the wall and a single slab mounted in its center. Sure enough, the body of a middle-aged man is splayed out on its steel surface. Even for a dead man, he seems unnaturally pale. Extreme blood loss will do that to you. Try as you might, you can't help but look at the man's face, his features twisted in abject horror. This was not a peaceful death. Looking closely, you notice two small puncture wounds on the victim's neck. If ever there were a clear sign of a vampire attack, you can get to see it. Looking over at D'Angelo, you notice his lips moving in a familiar fashion. He's narrating again before he can utter an... Inte intelligible. intelligible word you cut in with a remark. Those marks on his neck. Is that what I think it is? Yep, good eye, kid. It's official. Our killer is kindred. Look at this face, though. Sheer terror. He was fully aware all the way through. Killing aside, no kindred with their soul would allow that to happen. Unless they didn't even know better. This confirms it. We're looking for a thin blood. Fuck. As if on cue, the door swings open. A tired-looking man with a stethoscope around his neck walks in his... Fuck. With his eyes fixed on his clipboard, he doesn't appear to notice you yet. Kill him. <laughs> I knew it was an option. I don't... I'm not saying to do it. <laughs> I kind of want to, but... It's your options. What would you... What 
How do I save? <laughs> oh, I gotta save it quick though. God damn it. Uh, I want to feed on them, but again, I, I just fed the other day, or today, the same night. But that dude was on drugs. I don't know if that affects it. I don't either. Plus, I feel like that's just gonna. We're dealing with a crime scene that's gonna. Yeah, fuck it. Just as you open your mouth, desperately trying to come up with an excuse as to why you're here, D'Angelo turns into a blur of shadow and flat on. Next thing you know, he's hovering over the doctor's limp body. The gulping sound you hear confirms your suspicions. He took the opportunity to feed. Once he's done, he turns his crooked mug towards you, his stumpy fangs still dripping with blood. His smile is very red and very unnerving. What can I say, kid? Sometimes just go with your gut. I feel better him doing it. I don't care. Whatever. I already drank today. Now come on, let's get out of here. Time to pay our dear Premagen another visit. I will also say, I'm glad I tried to lie out of it instead of hiding behind the freezer just to like, like... Oh! <laughs> Robert Larson's home looks about the same as last time. No added security, no angry dogs prowling the yard. It appears that the thin-blooded... Primergin would rather risk another visit from his old pal D'Angelo than your, to arouse the suspicion of his family and neighbors. Which is good, considering that what he's about to get. Sure enough, the light in Larson's study is on, and you even catch a glimpse of the man himself shuffling around the room. You look over at D'Angelo, wondering how you're going to get Larson's attention this time. Without a single word, D'Angelo walks over to the nearby street lamp, leans against it, making sure he's visible to any and all who happen to look. Looks like time for suddenly is over. It only takes a couple of minutes for Larson to take notice. You see him lean against the window and storm out of the room. In mere seconds, he's out in front and in D'Angelo's face. Listen to me, you moldy fuck. I've had just about enough of your shit. You want to pester me? Fine, but leave my family out of it. For a moment, D'Angelo just stands there, motionless, allowing Larson to get his frustration out. Suddenly, he grabs the thin blood by the collar, lifts him off the ground, and smashes his back against the lamppost. Are you finished? All right, now you listen to me and listen good. You think I'm enjoying this? You think I like to be jerked around? You think I got nothing better to do than hang around this little puppet theater you made for yourself? Either you give me a lead I can follow, or I'll start remembering things you'd rather forget. For the first time since you met him, Larson looks speechless, his eyes wide with fear. He can only mutter under his breath. You wouldn't dare. Cry me. Cue awkward silence. You stand there, shifting your eyes from one vampire to another. He has the time to either press the advantage or play the good cop. Look, we're all a bit stressed out. How about we just all just take a deep breath, figuratively speaking? Nah, I don't feel like it. I'm tired of being nice, but some people don't appreciate nice. Some people do anything to cover their asses. Isn't that right, Robert? If you want my help, put me the fuck down. With his feet back on the ground, Larson straightens his collar in a faint attempt at preserving some shred of dignity. <sighs> There's a place in Manhattan, Lower East Side, one of the few places in the city where my people can find shelter. Yeah, I know it. If you go there right now, you might find what you're looking for. D'Angelo stares at him for a moment, just long enough to make it uncomfortable. You better. Finally, D'Angelo loosens his grip. You both watch Larson limp back to his house, looking back over his shoulder, like he's going to tell the teacher on you. You look to your partner, meaning to ask what that whole things you'd rather forget deal was. As if sensing your curiosity, D'Angelo cuts in with, a preemptive mutter. Come on, we got what we came for. <clears throat> As you reach the address Larson gave you, you find yourself standing in front of what looks like an old garage. On the outside, the place looks as uninteresting as it gets. You'd think it's abandoned, if not for a few barely working lights illuminating its shabby facade once you're inside, however. If ever there was a place worthy of being called a wretched hive of scum and villainy. This is probably it. We're going on, we're tapping on Disney's toes now. <laughs> the room is littered with drunks and crackheads, humans with thin blood alike, 
ant and blood alike. Their minds lost in their cruel little worlds, their bodies splayed out across the floor. D'Angelo leans over and whispers in your ear. I'll cover the back door. You stay near the front. Let's look around and see what we can find. Before you can ask what exactly you're supposed to be looking for, D'Angelo disappears into the shadows. Doing your best to blend in with the crowd, which is fairly difficult considering your upright position, you slowly make your way across the large room. Not really knowing what you're looking for, you focus on the details. A knowing smirk, a hateful stare, anything that looks even the slightest bit suspicious. After a dozen or so empty stares, you're almost ready to give up, when suddenly something catches your eye. A young skinny woman, hunched over the corner of the room, she gives you a bewildered look. A thousand yard stare that tells you, beyond the shadow of a doubt, it's her. As you walk towards her, D'Angelo emerges from the shadows right next to you. Nice catch. He kneels down beside her. You can tell he's trying to sound as comforting as possible, but with his gravelly timbre, it's not really working out. Hey, it's okay. We're not here to hurt you. We just want to talk. No, don't talk. Too loud. Too loud. She seems halfway out of it. It's like the lights are on, but whoever's inside is stumbling around after one hell of a bender. All right, you might quiet. Got it. Can you tell me your name? Sano. That's what he calls me. Suddenly you hear the door swing open behind you. Even though the night is fairly warm, a cold chill runs down your spine. You look towards the entrance. There's a woman standing there. Something about her just screams kindred. Even though she seems comically overdressed for the situation, somehow you don't feel like cracking a smile. Whoever she is, you can tell she means business. She starts making her way to the back of the room, not making any effort to sidestep any of the junkies and drunks. They all know well enough to get out of her way. Acting out of bravery or sheer stupidity, you walk up to her. She looks at you as if you were something she just scraped off her shoe. You smile nervously without even knowing it. Oh, I hate all these. As soon as you open your mouth, her hand shoots out, grabbing you by the throat. Of course she does. The woman looks at you, tilting her head as if examining the curious species of an insect. Suddenly her eyes shift as she notices something behind you. Her face turns from dis disgusted curiosity into sheer annoyance. You go ahead. You. <laughs> yeah, Val, that's my assistant you got there. Do you mind? She rolls her eyes. You feel the grip on your neck loosen, and you awkwardly fall to your feet. She makes her way towards the Angelo, pushing you aside like a rag doll. Where is she? You're going to have to be a bit more specific, darling. Don't play coy, Jenny, the manslayer. I know she's here. A blood hunt has begun my orders, but by order of the prince herself. The girl is to meet her final death. Hold your horses, honey. I'm conducting an investigation under the auspice of the sheriff. That counts for something, too. Look, sweetie, I'm not here for some clit measuring contest. I want this to get... You want this to get ugly? Be my guest. Otherwise... I suggest you step aside and let me do my job. I have no clue how to voice it. Yeah, I know. By all means. He steps aside in a comically exaggerated fashion. You look at the corner where you last saw Sana, but find no trace of the girl. Well, I'll be. I could swear she was just here. Valerie looks at D'Angelo. She smiles softly, but you can tell she's trying very hard not to rip his head off. You'll regret this. Wow. Story of my life. Without another word, she turns on her heel and storms out. D'Angelo waves his hand in your general direction. Come on, kid, let's get out of this shithole. As you emerge from said shithole, you feel a cool night breeze caress your face. It's soothing and almost makes you forget how shitty the last few hours have been. Almost. I really hate how any vampire you run into can just, like, slap you down like you're nothing. <laughs> okay, kid. I know you've got questions, but it's getting early and I don't feel like having a Q&A session right now. For now, you get one question. Make it count. Still hard to believe that girl is our killer. Do you know where she ran off to? Not sure, but I might have some ideas. The important thing is, we know who we're looking for. Too bad Valerie knows too. 
She's a scourge, kid. Part enforcer, part assassin. All around pain in the ass. We'll be seeing more of her, you can bet on that. And before you ask, yes, we've run into each other in the past. No, I don't feel like talking about it. I didn't ask, buddy. <laughs> All right, kid. I don't know about you, but I'm turning in. I'll figure some stuff out and keep looking for our girl. Feel free to sing by my office in a night or two. And with that, he stumbles off into the distance, not even bothering to keep to the shadows. Can't say you blame him. It really has been a rough night. And we are... Well, no. Not yet. You're walking... Oh. Have we not gone home yet? I guess not. You're walking down the street towards your haven. In some other town, the sidewalks would be deserted this time of night. In New York City, there are plenty of passerby, passersby going about their business. It's easy to be paranoid when you're a vampire surrounded by a crowd of humans. The kindred have many enemies, and all those enemies have one trait in common. They're invisible and distinguishable from normal humanity. Other vampire hunters all look alike. All look like people. Is that old man just a tired restaurant worker, or a kindred thrall tailing your movements? Are those officers idly waiting in a patrol car ordinary cops, or second inquisition specialists looking to end your undead threats? This kind of think thinking leads to madness, but can't shake the feeling that someone is watching you. It's not the first time you've felt like this. Whatever it is, it's probably something you have to take care of. Best case, someone is tailing you. Worst case, you'll be attacked and killed. Fortunately, being undead has its limitations. The sun is coming up soon, and you'll burn to a crisp if you stay on the streets. You reach your haven and settle in for the day, disconcerted by the idea that someone might know where you sleep. Okay, we're going to find out what happens the next day, next time. Thank you for joining us, guys. We'll catch you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.